All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Pursuit of Ownership. This is a Practice Underwater edition of our segment. Um, I'm back here with George and a very interesting Dennis who insists on being called Batman today. So we're going to be talking to him and learning a little bit about his situation. And uh, uh, we're mostly going to be going over. He is in the pre-ownership stage and he's not quite looking at a practice just yet, just sort of trying to establish his vision, uh, what he's looking for. And uh, this is a concept that's really near and dear to me because, you know, personally, I'm kind of going through it myself and I'm sure George will be able to help with it as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Batman go ahead and take it away. So Batman, tell us your story. All right. So I'm a little different than most of the guys in the show. I guess a lot of uh, new grads, whereas I've been out for a bit. I uh, graduated in 2012, did a year of residency. Um, early on, I wanted to uh, be like a super dentist. I wanted to really do everything under the sun. And I uh, took a lot of CE, um, do a lot of procedures, um, worked in different environments, started Medicaid out of, uh, out of school, out of residency. Um, then eventually moved on to, you know, higher end PPO, fee-for-service practices. Um, you know, and I had an opportunity. I was in an affluent area in one of the bigger cities uh, in the suburbs. And the plan was to stay there. You know, I grew up in the neighborhood. I grew up around there. I uh, went to school there. Um, the plan was to stay there. And um, got into an associateship, which was supposed to transition into a partnership. It was a large practice. We were doing about $2 million. And uh, the owner had two practices, um, you know, 10 miles apart, whatever it was. And um, he was doing two days in each. And I was supposed to transition into that, you know, by 25%, by 30%, whatever it would be. And I told myself, if that doesn't work out, then I'll go to, um, you know, I'll go somewhere more, a different state, somewhere that's more conducive to growth. Um, so it, uh, you know, it was working out. It was doing okay. It was, we weren't growing. I wasn't growing. My, my personal side of the practice wasn't growing due to, uh, you know, competition in the area. And um, we started talking and he kind of sprung the news on me that uh, he wanted to sell me the whole thing. He was just selling both practices, uh, moving out of state, uh, moving to the state where I actually am now. And uh, he was going to start something with a buddy of his, um, just completely. He was, a, he was a great clinician, taught me a lot. Uh, he had an MHED, so he did everything under the sun. So um, that practice, you know, he was maxing it out. He was doing everything. He was doing, you know, rich splitting, any type of surgery you could think of, all the wisdom teeth. He was really, you know, he was really going for it. And, uh, you know, I wasn't going to add procedures. Um, he was doing, you know, he taught me sleep apnea. He taught me um, implants. He taught me a lot of stuff. He taught me a lot of wisdom teeth. I don't do wisdom teeth. I prefer not to. But I can if I need to. That's probably the only thing I really refer out on a regular basis. Everything else I try to keep in house. And, um you know, we had, we had ortho. Ortho was doing about 15%. At that time, when I was looking into, um, when I was looking at the contracts, this was about a year and a half ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And, um, you know, I didn't know the numbers that I got from, um, from uh, what's the guy that uh, you've had him on about four or five shows. He, t he teaches you to evaluate practices. He's buying up practice. Hunter, Hunter Smith. Oh, okay. Right, of course. Yeah. Front of the show. Yeah, so I uh, I didn't you know I didn't hear his stuff before, so I didn't even know how to evaluate it. So I wasn't looking at the hygiene percentage. I wasn't looking at you know um, you know I kind of just they gave me the numbers. I looked at the numbers and I'm like all right, sure. Um, looking back now, I don't know what the hygiene was, but if I had to estimate, it's probably about fifteen at most. So he was really cranking it. Yeah, and um, I figured I'm not going to bring anything to the practice. If anything, we'll, we'll take a step back because I'm not doing a lot of the procedures. You know, a lot of the anterior implants I wasn't doing. Uh, you know, I'm just doing the easy ones. Um, I'm not doing the sinus lifts. I'm not doing um, the ridge splitting as of yet. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to add anything to it. And the area was just saturated. It's an affluent area, um, ton of dentists. They're all marketing. They're all on top of their game. So it's not going to be an easy area to really go into and uh, bring, you know, grow, grow externally. So I ended up uh, just the risk was too high at that point. Didn't know what to do. Um, you know, didn't want to jump into it because I figured a lot could go wrong there. And, uh, you know, made the move uh made the move to a different state um state that's growing um down south and um just associating completely different environment um just more more for a quick buck uh but i've been looking around you know i kind of set myself up to acquire something i saved you know made a good amount of money saved a good amount of money down here um you know i've talked to banks i'm ready to go ready to pull the trigger essentially um you know production history is there money's in the bank whatever you know, everything checks out the only thing is um when i was living up north um, of course, the living is expensive. You know, you're making less money. So even though it's a good PPO practice, you know, you're still, you know, you're not taking home a crazy amount. 
And you're taking home, you know, 200, low 200, some, some, something in that uh, particular area, just because I wasn't booked fully. Um, you know, my first year there, I did about seven, high sevens to eights. Um, and he said, my mentor, my old mentor said, you're just going to grow. You're going to hit a million production, you're going to hit 1.1, 1.2. And it just mm-hmm. never materialized. We never got, you know, the bigger cases that I triple plan went to him. You know, um, just things didn't really materialize. There's too much opening on my schedule. So, um, yeah, so so that's pretty much what led me here. As far as what I want, what I'm looking for, at first I was Can I really... stop you right there? Sure. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. I want to start. So we kind of looked at two things. We talked about your clinical history, mm-hmm. and then we talked about this practice opportunity. I feel like I want to dive into each one separately, starting with your skill set. So talk about your talk more about your clinical skill set and it seems like you almost said like i like do i i i i can't do a lot of it almost feels like you took a step back from being the super gp or i don't know if that was just the way you said it or something but talk about that a little bit um well m- mentally i don't want to be that uh when i was talking to my old mentor the reason he was selling um, one of the reasons was that he was just burnt out and he was in his early fifties and he was rocking and rolling. His production was, was great. And he was just running around he said, he just put out fires and he was just, he wanted a different kind of a practice model, not to be chair side, which is kind of what I'm thinking. You know, I'll, I'll do clinical. I want to do clinical, but I don't want to, I want to have a bigger group practice that cash flows for me because okay. I'm getting older. I'm 33 years old. You know, I'm getting a little aches and pains here and there, back, this, that. So I feel like sure. if you're going, you know, if you're going hard, um, you know, clinically for four or five days a week, let's say four days a week. Yeah, you're taking home, you know, you're making a great living, but everything depends on you. If your bag goes out for, you know, or God forbid, you know, cancer, or whatever, for a couple of months, a year, whatever it may be, you're, you know, you're not going to be doing too well. So I want to not burn myself out in that respect. Um, early on, I want to try to build the practice. I want to try to, you know, do what I have to do. I don't care about working five, six days a week, you know, five, six days if I have to, just to get it going. But it's not something I want to do uh, for a long, you know, long period of time. Uh, down the road, I want to cut down about three or four days, ideally in a bigger, in a larger group practice. Yeah. So w- what I'm picking up is you're not necessarily saying you want to step back from your whole clinical suite, but rather you want a practice that does not depend on, you know, your blood, sweat and tears all the time. You're looking for something that's much more sustainable for you is, is what you were really trying to get across. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. the actual skill set itself, y- you enjoy your array of procedures that you offer and you don't plan on changing that one way or the other? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I'll, ideally, I want to cut down if, uh, you know, if I want, you know, if I want the Powerball tomorrow, I probably wouldn't practice. I don't hate dentistry. A lot of guys, I got buddies that hate it. I don't mind it. It's fine. Um, yeah, but I just want to cut down but, on volume. Exactly. I don't want to do the fillings. You know, I'd rather do more surgical stuff you know, a couple okay. days a week. Um, but ideally, my biggest issue now is I've been listening to you guys. I've listened to um, the entire um, underwater uh, segment, all of them. Well, not the last two. The last two I think I had. Well, I would just move. We actually just moved in the state uh, where I've been. So I've been kind of. I'll let it pass. All right. Sounds good. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, I'm looking my, right now. It's just, you know, I'm kind of taking this time off that we have to really. Sure. I mean, here is a list of state docs you know 55 yeah. to whatever so i'm going right. through the list i'm uh you know doing mailers i've done about 200 so far for that uh, particular metro and um you know trying to think of the best approaches trying to you know so far i haven't gotten many calls back i really but it hasn't been too long maybe a week and a half since i mailed the first batch i've gotten a couple calls back really? nothing uh, nothing substantial yet I just kind of trying to figure out what my next step will be after I kind of go through it once, you know, see if you guys have any suggestions on uh, just picking some of the ones I highlighted, some that were potentially better than others. You know, I go to the website and kind of see if they have a partner, if they've sold or whatever it looks like. Mm-hmm. So try to, should I email, should I mail those again? Should I call them? Uh, but just essentially trying to find the right practice because my biggest right. thing now is my student loans. I forgot about that. I kind of got off on a tangent. I really haven't been paying them. I've really been taking easy with, you know, taking it easy with them. I went to a private school, so they're significant. They're um, substantially bigger than they were when I walked out. So I need to kind of get that under control. Uh, the banks okay. aren't going to – that's not a problem for the banks. I've talked to the banks. Basically, the practice is cash flow and no problem. But it's something that I don't want to wait too long. You know, I feel like, uh, like you guys say, uh, have some fire. <laughs> you know, I feel like uh, time, time's ticking, you know. Maybe <laughs> a year, year and a half. But I want to jump into something where I could ideally – big hygiene department, uh, you know, controlled overhead 
procedure mix that I could add to. I want to be able to grow a practice significantly internally quickly just by adding procedures. And then externally, we'll worry about, uh, you know, marketing. Uh, like you said, if you could, you know, like George said, if you could do certain procedures, the patients are worth more to you, so you could spend more on marketing per patient. So I'm thinking, you know, thinking in that regard more so. Well, before, I know you want to get into the nuts and bolts of all that, and, and we certainly will, but I just want to make sure that we kind of totally understand where you're coming from and in terms of your sure. vision, in terms of why you're looking to get an ownership. One thing that I, that I noticed throughout your whole story um, is there's a lot of jumping around, um, you know, just, just geographically. I mean, you just went from back cave to back cave, you know, looking for <laughs> the right opportunity that suited you. Right. So, you know, what, what is, I'm trying to kind of get an idea of what kind of net you're really casting. It, you said you already did your mailers, like how, uh, how flexible are you on, you know, moving to different locations, looking at different places? What is your ideal place that you actually want to be? Cause that's, you know, one thing we talk about a lot here is it's, it's, it's not always so dependent on, Oh, let me find the perfect, uh, opportunity wherever that may be anywhere in the country. It's, you know, where do I want to live? Where, where, where am I going to be happy? So uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what is this really all about? If, if, you know, if you know yeah, absolutely. Getting... Absolutely. So, um, you know, I spent a good amount of time in a, in a large city, one of the big, bigger cities, uh, you know, so it, it's, you know, I spent the last 10 years there. Um, that's why I wasn't paying my uh, student loans because cost of living was so high. But uh, to me at that point, was single, it was single, it was a trade-off. It was worth it. Um, I was learning. I looked at that more more so than making the money. Uh, so I, the plan was to stay in that particular area, whether it's the suburbs, whether it's, you know, the plan was to just stay there. Um, the move happened. I was looking into a larger city. Uh, the, it was a company. It was a large company. They reached out. They had other practices in smaller. It wasn't rural, but it was just smaller, uh, more distant, uh, you know, more distant areas. And, um, you know, they said you could make more money. So I said, for, for a year, screw it. I'll go down. I'll make a quick buck. And uh, we were down there. It was I love little... how you call it a quick buck. I've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, second just... time. I, love I do that. like it. Yeah. Oh, make a quick buck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh... Batman coming out, killing it. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. But um, yeah. So I was um, so I was down there. It was it was livable. It, you know, it had all the you know major amenities that you needed. Um, the difficult issue was the flight. You know, no major airports. You have to fly through somewhere else. So, um, mm. you know, it turned into an ordeal, something that should have been a two and a half, three hour flight turned into a seven hour adventure, you know, and it was adventure every right. time because the weather delays, whatever it may be. And it's just, uh, you know, we kind of narrowed it down to a few cities that, um, in the state that we would want to live in metro areas, you know, suburbs. Mm -hmm. And, um, I asked the company to transfer me, they transferred me to one of those, the ones that I actually preferred at the time. So now we're kind of shut down. So I have this time to write the letters and, you know, reach out. But I'm planning on staying here in the particular area, in the particular state for sure. Um, I'm probably, I have no preference as to which of the two cities um, I would want to stay in. Uh, the one where I am now, most likely it's just, you know, 75% chance that's where we'll end up just because I have my you know, boots on the ground here. I could kind of meet the brokers, meet the supply people, reach out, go to you know, the Seattle study club, whatever study clubs and try mm -hmm. to do something. But I'm open to if a great opportunity comes down the other city. I'll make the move. Um, so I'm really what about going another state? Um, depends. It would have to be, I'd be open to it. I'd be open to it. Um, it as long as it's a larger metro area, uh, you know, they, they have a Whole Foods around the corner, not too far. You have an airport that's within an hour, hour and a half I where see. you could get everywhere directly. Yeah, I'm wondering because you, you kind of have this like, you're like I'm super flexible. I'll live anywhere in these two cities, but like yeah. it seems like you'd live anywhere. Like uh, I don't know, I've because you're looking for a larger practice, right. and so the thing that Tyler and I are sort of getting at is with a larger practice, you have to cast a bigger net, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or Definitely. you just have to yeah. be way more diligent. But the bigger net you can cast, the better the opportunities. You know, the more likely you are to find somebody. So if you're like, hey, I'm willing to live in like these 15 cities, for example, man, your ability to find a practice goes way up. Versus Absolutely. I, I get you can focus like 80% of your effort on, you know, those two cities that you want to live in that are close by in the state or whatever, but having 10, 15, I mean, it seems like your requirements are a Whole Foods and a Walmart. Like it doesn't seem like, I mean, I'm curious to hear more about your requirements yeah. for a place to live because it seems super chillaxed and, you know, easy. And so I'm, I'm kind right. of wondering, you know, I would take advantage of that by going somewhere that has the best opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we live in an area, it wasn't, it's a pretty quiet city. Uh, I mean, you guys 
may know it, you may not. I didn't know about it. I didn't know about the area that it even existed. It's about a million people there. So it's a pretty, pretty big uh, metro area that's kind of out of the way. And, uh, you know, the restaurants weren't there. So that's something that now that we've moved into a bigger city, an actual city, um, you know, I could get good sushi, I could get good ramen, I could get good whatever. You know, there's nothing outside of, uh, you know, Mexican and barbecue and chains. So there's really a lot, <laughs> lack of food options. But so just... Houston and Dallas are your two cities? Correct. Okay, I was, that was, I'm so happy we clarified because I was thinking we're talking like Florida or Georgia or like two. No, like, I, okay, I was thinking. Yeah, that. we're talking. Yeah, so that's totally different. You're actually pretty unflexible. You know, you were like kind of, okay, I'll be easy going. But like those are two really good cities to live in, you know, great food. So yeah. stay with your preferences. Maybe, you know, yeah, I, I don't think you're. I don't think you'd benefit a whole lot from opening it up to five different states. A lot of states don't have those types of cities with that type of uh, populations. You know that those are two yeah. top ten cities in the United States. Yeah, so, for sure. um, yeah. Well, you're well, that is, eclectic mix of restaurants that, that yeah, it seems yeah. like you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, when you guys said to cast the wider net, um, I don't even know if I could get through Dallas because I'm going through these and I got forty pages of this stuff, and these are all guys, mm -hmm. you know, fifty to and up. Yeah, yeah, but think about how many of them have a larger practice. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Probably well, ten percent of them. Exactly. Yeah. So your fifty is five. Right. True. You know, and then so a bigger net is still needed. It's just more work for you. Exactly. Well, time wise, <laughs> you know, there's no way I could have done this if I was working because I feel like I'm putting you know four or five hours a day. Right. I'm going eight by name, googling it, looking at their website, looking at you know Street View, and uh, trying to see yeah. if they've sold it, they have a partner, whatever they look like. So it's what kind of stuff are you looking at on their website? Um, main th well, I look at what they do. So if, if they have an MHD or if they're just, you know, a super dentist, I kind of try to shy away from that just because I'll still reach out potentially if it looks like they have a big hygiene, but I try to shy away from it just because I was, I'm not going to add much to it. Um, I'm looking for guys that doesn't seem like there's a lot in their bio. They like to go fishing. They like to spend time with family. They don't really talk about dentistry in their bio because you got to figure those guys aren't doing too much. I'm looking at the <laughs> hygiene staff, trying to get as much as I can, you know, ideally two and up. Um, you know, I'm not looking at it. If it looks like one hygienist and I kind of try to look at pictures, I look at, uh, if I can, yesterday, one guy had the 360 view of the office. I went through that looking for ops. He, great practice, three ops. I wasn't going to, you know, I'm looking for ideally, ideally, at least like you said, five, six ops, five at the minimum. And, uh, that's just hygiene, the staff size from the pictures and just try to get as much information about what the dentist does as I can, uh, just from reading his bio and looking at the procedures. Uh, two things. One, there's a little like a f snapping noise. Is that, um, I don't know what that is, but yeah, I just want to, if our editors. Yeah, I think it's that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so editors want to cut that out. But going back to the, so I personally feel like the opportunity that you had, if it was New York or up north, we're calling it, you know, I feel like it, it it's still kind of sitting with you. Whatever reason you passed up on that practice is kind of affecting the way you're looking at future practices. You know, I've never thought of looking for like an MAGD or so I want I don't want to buy like I never thought of wanting to buy a practice for somebody who likes to fish. You know, I haven't really thought about that one way or the other. It's new. And I think that that is I want to talk about that opportunity a little bit because I think it might be holding you back mm -hmm. uh moving forward because really, I mean, I'll just the reality is you could probably add to almost any practice just like who you like, Oh, I do sleep apnea, ortho and everything, but wisdom teeth. I I'll do them, but I don't really want like what. That's who, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, yeah. there's no older dentist who you're not going to add to their practice. Like that's just the reality of it. Yeah. So, you know, focusing on that stuff is taking away from really, you should be looking at number of hygienists and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. You're, sh you're shrinking your net a little bit you know, by projecting from, you know, the bios or whatever you're seeing in the websites, you know, I, it, it doesn't really hurt to send more mailers and maybe anticipate more responses. You know what I mean? Like obviously the three op practice is out. Like I'm with you yeah, on that. Right. For sure. But for sure. I, I would go to website, count hygienists, anything two plus, I'm sending them a mailer and giving them a call. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it's really that simple. Um, but I do want to talk about that practice a little bit okay. because do you remember some of the financial information? Like if I were to ask you some questions on collections and overhead and that type of stuff? Um, or not really? Uh, I could ballpark. I was actually thinking about it yesterday. I uh, just figured once I got the email, it may, have, it may go in that direction. So I think um, collection-wise, I was doing about high sevens. I was at five days a week. The owner was doing about high sevens to eight twice a week. 
So that's about, let's call it 750 each. So let's call it 15, uh, 1.5. Um, we had ortho. Ortho was about 15, 12 to 15%, somewhere in that range. So that's about 370, I think, somewhere, or 270. Like an orthodontist? Yeah. Okay, and, never, never. Uh, and uh, yeah, we did Invisalign. Both of us did Invisalign, uh, mm -hmm. pieces here and there. Uh, and then hygiene was, uh, we had about two and a half to three full time hygienists. But the, you know, I think the ratio, the hygiene percentage would have been like 15% or at most when I was doing that kind of math, when I was trying to do the math in my head yesterday, sit down and try to write it down. And, you know, all the stuff that I'm doing, he taught me how to do essentially. So, um, you know, that, that was my, my, that was what was holding back. And the other thing was that he did everything as cheaply as possible. Um, literally just ordering, we ordered some MTA once. And I opened it up, and uh, the instructions were in Russian. So I had no idea how he got it, where he got it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he was American. It wasn't, you know, like an old Russian man. He was American. <laughs> so he, so he's uh, reinforceable is what you mean. So, he, yeah, so his overhead was low. His overhead, <laughs> what they were telling me at the time, you know, was about 55 or so. I'm sure prior to paying me, uh, prior to paying the orthodontist probably. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure but it was just cheap. There's no way I could keep this up. I have. What was the for, asking price on this? One eight. Okay. All right. Seven, five, I'm with you eight. on passing it up. I'm with yeah. you. I I think um, the only lingering thing that I would take from it is that, you know, somebody with an FAGD on their website isn't not the guy that you worked for before. You know, I think right. he's the exact, like you can sniff that out so easily on a production report that mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to be afraid of buying that practice on accident. Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I think realistically walking in with most sellers, you know, somebody 55 and up, like you wouldn't have even caught your boss on 55 and up. You know, most people that have been doing this for a long time do it in a way that's sustainable. And yeah. that's not the environment you came from. Hence, you know, the selling and moving around and all that stuff. So um, I guess I thought there was more there than there was. I, I guess for me, the idea of passing up on a $2 million practice is hard. Uh, but when it has two and a half to three hygienists and all that you were describing, yeah, I would probably not buy that one either, to be honest. He ended up selling it actually to get this to two girls. Um, not exactly from what it seems like, because I talked to the assistants. So not the best clinicians out there, pretty narrow scope of practice. And I don't know how they're doing, but you know, I'm sure the production numbers are going to take a massive, take massive it. dip. And, you know. Tyler, does that surprise you that I'd pass on that practice too? A little bit. A little yeah? bit. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly. Well, I'll, 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 I'll talk my way through it for the audience. So Please. when I'm looking at that practice, I, from Yuri's perspective, I, my guess is he could maintain, he would probably, right, roles would reverse. So he, that guy's doing 750 on two days a week, which means he's filtering up all the top level procedures over on his end. Yeah. And so Yuri should be able to bring those back. I would say that the practice is probably doing 2.2-ish based on kind of what he described. So I would definitely think it would take a hit to like 1.9, but Yuri would have to replace that with an associate. Right. So he'd have to have another associate who'd probably work four days a week and produce, let's just say, four or 500. Mm -hmm. But the issue is you have a drop-off in dentist with that type of clinical skill set. Yuri could take some of it over, but there's going to be a drop-off in production, but also it doesn't seem like patient flow. You'd need an excess. You'd have to have the ability to generate patient flow. And the fact that they're doing so much on so few patients puts a lot of pressure on the, yeah. on the whole okay. environment. Sense. And so, yeah, it's, it's a high asking price. It's probably doing 1.9 after a transition and, you know, maybe 2, 2.1. But there's definitely going to be a, a substantial drop off, especially on diagnosis with mm -hmm. going from a seller to a regular associate. And yeah. I, I would just stay away from it, especially 1.8 high fixed costs. Uh, yeah, I would. I would much rather have the practice that yeah. can. Yeah. Right. So right. So maybe do, uh, it's not as bad as it's not a bad opportunity, but it's just more stressful than I'd like. Yeah. Okay. So do we know enough about Batman's situation here to where we could start to form a picture of what his ideal purchase opportunity looks like? One question. Mm -hmm. your willingness and ability to work with a seller associate. I think that would be kind of the last thing I'd need to know yeah. uh, before we could really paint a picture for you because you, I mean, don't take this the wrong way. 
you seem like a guy that wants to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And there is a song and dance when you're practicing with a seller. And so the type of opportunity you look for, there's two ways of going about it. One, you buy a larger practice and you work with the seller typically, or you, you know, if they have an associate, that's great, but that's not super common. Or the other one is you buy your own practice that can grow into a larger practice and then you grow it yourself and onboard your own associate. And so depending on your ability to be flexible in life and, you know, kind of give and take and share and all that stuff, it'll kind of dictate which way you would go. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on potentially practicing with another seller and having to, you know, play second fiddle for a little bit. Um, it's a great question. I, I'd be open to it for the right practice. I feel like it, it would be hard, um, you know, just in the fact that as long as he's there, it's going to be his staff. Uh, I can't, it'll be hard to kind of transition into, in their eyes for, for you to be the boss. Um, I could I could deal with that for 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 some time for a short period of time, but I feel like in the long run I you know I'd want to transition because I'd want a PPO office more so than fee for service. I feel like I could get an associate easier, um, so I'd want the PPO office and like a decent income area, you know, um, decent income area. And um, so with that, uh, I'd be okay with a little bit of the transition. I wouldn't want it to be you know a year because I feel like the staff is gonna you know I, feel, I mean I don't know what your thoughts are. Would you be able to? Have you done it with you know people that have done it for a year for a long period of time and uh, were able to kind of turn the staff over to become a nurse staff or do you have to fire the staff slowly? Is there a turnover that way and then you hire people as you're losing staff? Tyler, thoughts on uh, <laughs> Batman's ability to have a, a seller associate? It, I I hear a lot of trepidation in in Batman's voice. I do. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think it, it's a great fit for it Batman. Sounds, it sounds very it sounds very <laughs> conditional. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, so, Batman doesn't want to rob it. Yeah. No. And so, right. There might be a very six months, but it could. It have to be positioned as a six month situation, probably for yeah. it to fit for right. what you're looking for. I had so my situation was my seller was supposed to stay a lot longer than she ended up staying, and I kind of got to see it from both ways. I got to see it with the idea that your seller would stay, and I don't think one situation is better than the other. It just pick your problem, mm-hmm. and so. Do you want your problem to be associate turnover and potentially having to coach associates and not enjoying certain aspects of babies? You know, I don't want to call it babysitting associates, but you know, there is a there's this level of yeah, there is a level of babysitting an associate kind of when you have one, and it's that versus managing the whole. I don't want to call it a, it's not a power struggle, but it, there is this component of their staff, your staff, and sharing patients and different clinical philosophies. Obviously you are very, right. You're a very super GP. We've talked about that. So you come in here and you're going to be substantially more and they're going to view you as aggressive Aggressive, clinically when you may just be totally calm. And I'm not calling you aggressive or conservative, but my guess is that clinically there's not going to be a whole lot of eye to eye in the way that you guys see cases versus an associate. You can control that more. So it's just pick the problem. And you know, a seller might be good with working two days a week part time while you ease into growing your practice to sustain two full time dentists versus an associate's not going to want to do that as much. They're going to want, you know, more hours, more patients. And so there's a lot more share. So it's just you picking your problem. And so I've, I've seen it both ways. I've had it both ways. I, I typically like, to be honest, I really do like not having the seller there once you are comfortable and confident and all that stuff. But initially, it was nice having the seller there on a lot of levels. I was a new grad. I needed the clinical mentorship. So I got that. But in general, I, I think for you, the better path would likely be one that does not include a long-term seller associate. Mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, my long-term vision, I guess, would be because my wife's sister is a dentist. Not, not here. She would never move down here. She's in Seattle. But she'd be somebody no quick like buck that. for her down south. <laughs> no quick buck, but she'd be <laughs> some, somebody like that. Just uh, you know, some of her husband's a physician, so she just needs a steady paycheck. She needs to be treated well, you know, which she's not taken advantage of by the, the bigger company, and she she's happy. So somebody like that would long term be the best associate. I feel like they'll stay if you, they're making good money. They're you know being treated well. They're not gonna they're not gonna go anywhere. She wants to go home. She wants to spend time with the baby. She wants to work her three, four days a week, whatever it may be. And then she doesn't want to deal with the staff, deal with the issues. So there's really no worry of her leaving, you know, and going somewhere else and starting her own practice. So I feel like eventually I try to get somebody like that to really, you know, get some you know, stability at that position for, for a long time. 
So would you be okay with the idea of walking into an office by yourself and growing it into that? Or do you feel like you want to walk into a two dentist practice? I'd be fine with growing it by myself. Uh, you yeah. know, I'd be fine with growing it by myself. That's kind of what I saw. And then I, you know, the more I listened to um, you guys with practice underwater and uh, the more I kind of opened my eyes to, you know, having a two dentist practice right away. Um, but I figured I'll jump in there and I'm open to either or, but I figured I'll jump in there initially. Um, I'll try to crank it internally. Um, you know, really build it up externally, get the patient flow going, and then get a get an associate in there. It may take a while to get the right associate. You may have to go through, you know, go through a few, but um, probably somebody who's, you know, somebody who's you know, a woman that's married that just needs a good, you know, needs a good job, steady income, a couple of days a week. You know, not really. So if she's single, it's not going to work. <laughs> Maybe it will. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it seems like your your kind of your two your two practices then your two avatars are one that is a seller associate kind of like the one that you were going to buy minus all the clinical stuff, mm -hmm. where the guy just wants to leave and there's already an associate in place and then you could walk in and replace the seller and have that current associate be retained, or the second route where you just replace the seller and probably a larger practice and then grow it to be a, a group practice. Right. So I would think those are the two. Tyler, yeah. what do you feel? Yeah, no, I, I I totally understand that, and I, and I think that Batman's kind of getting a clearer vision of you know what his ideal transition is really going to look like, and you know in these next few weeks. I mean, I don't I don't know if all the doctors you uh, sent those mailers out are you know really super open to receiving them right now. I'm not exactly right. sure where people are mentally amidst what's going on, but you know you're going to think that was a great time. That's Honestly, what I was you think it's the right time? Okay. Oh okay. yeah, totally. COVID is a great time to contact these people. Good timing. Actually, I had a guy. Um, um, Sorry, I had a guy. He called me. Uh, he said that he had, hadn't thought about selling until now with COVID, and then he saw my letters. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Fantastic! That's great. Yeah, no. COVID is um, the best time. <laughs> two two contact sellers, not yes, for not. any other reason. Yeah, there's a caveat in that sentence. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a good time for our country or anything. I'm just saying it's a good time for contact sellers about buying their practice. It's, it's we're going into a buyer's market, at least for the, yes. for the time being. Hopefully. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're you're going to be hearing back. Um, you know, from potential sellers, and that's going to be a conversation that needs to happen. Is you need to be able to talk about timelines, and you need to know where they're coming from too. And you know, ultimately, now that you kind of have a bit of a better idea of where you're coming from, I think that's going to inform those conversations that are going to be coming up. You know, you could be getting a call today, and so it's going to be important that you, you know, come into it understanding what your ideal transition looks more like. Which it sounds like it's one where you're sort of taking over, and then you're growing the practice, and then adopting an associate later on. Yeah. At least, I mean, that's my thoughts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Size wise, would you guys say um, five ops? Would that be uh, too small? Go with six, six and up. So I'm shaking my head ferociously. It is uh, six, honestly. Oof. I don't even like six a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Really. Okay. It, six, I would take if it's the right practice and I felt like in the future I could add without having to move locations. Mm hmm. So, you know, sometimes there's like the space next door, it's a freestanding building, something, but man, think about it. You're going to have three or four hygienists, two dentists and six operatories, right? You know, you want the mom that's there two or three days a week. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to not work and then you guys have to expand hours and all yeah. this stuff that um, it's a lot of bending to fit in six ops. Mm -hmm. So I have eight and wish I had 10. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because we're now maxed out at our eight. And mm -hmm. now I have to start doing gymnastics or move right. or blow down the door next door, you know, something. Yeah. And that's annoying. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm only a year and a half in. So yeah. 10, 20 years from now, all of a sudden the number of operatories gets really more and more annoying, especially if your goal is to grow a more and more passive business. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd stand firm on that one. Yeah, and I, and I think that's something we alluded to in our in our last interview uh, with Dr. Nick. Um, we kind of talked about, you know, you're never really going to be mad about having, you know, an unused op that's not being used, you know, right now. I mean, ultimately, that's something that you could potentially grow into. But when you do get frustrated is when you know that you're ready to expand and you don't have that room to grow. You know, it's, it's time to change your shoe size and you know, you know, you don't have that potential. So I, I think that, you know, you're, you're being very good about, you know, waiting for the right opportunity. 
And it would be a shame if you shortchanged yourself and and settled with something that was, you know, a little bit too small and you ended up outgrowing it a lot, you know, sooner than you expected to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But now how do we guard against, right? I think the thing you're probably thinking is, well, you already told me that there's not enough practices of my size. And now you're telling me even the six op ones, I shouldn't even like, we're, we're, we're telling you to be really picky. And now you have to have sushi and ramen. So now you can't live in anywhere that's not Houston or Dallas. So, you know, I think for you, what I would say is, that puts more and more pressure on your ability to find deals. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what you're doing right now, and I think we can help you maybe up your game a little bit in that area. Perfect. Uh, Yeah, so what what I'm doing now, um, I found a list of dentists, uh, a spreadsheet of every dentist practicing or every licensed dentist in the state. Um, Went through the list. I I was doing it county by county. So um, right now I'm I'm looking at the main county, uh, the biggest county. Uh, So I just put age-wise from 50 to, because um, it goes Did by the date Did they their age on the list? Uh, they had the date of birth. So I'm, I'm oh, going from man. 50 to, to, to up. 50 to, basically, I got a guy that was, that was in his 90s. <laughs> I don't know if he's still <laughs> practicing or not. <laughs> but, um, Jeez, that guy's going to sell uh, quick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> COVID. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, so I'm just going down the list, and uh, you know it's time-consuming. I'm trying to see income-wise. That was my other question. Uh, what's a sweet that also spot? on the list? Uh, it's not. You have to Google the practice and you know take a look at the average household income for that particular neighborhood. That, that's a oh, pain. I see what you're saying. Okay. That's a massive pain to do. At this point, I've been doing it for a week uh, since the move with the COVID, so I have a pretty good idea. I'll just Google the location. I'll know what the income, the general income, would be there. <laughs> uh, but income-wise, I'm looking at you know 60, 70, and up. With that, because uh, breakaway says 50. Uh, some of my buddies suggest to go a little higher than 50 because 50, you know, like what would you say would be the, the, bare, the bare minimum uh, for a group practice for the good group practice on different procedures for a household? Well, I don't feel like it's group practice or not. So break away that number of 55 K mm-hmm. is not the average income that they suggest that, that, that stat that they say gets misinterpreted a lot. It is, they want a certain number of people within that area with at least that much money. Gotcha. So if it's an average, then half the people have half less people than that. Yeah. Half the people have more than that. So mm-hmm. realistically, to get, you know, I don't want to two math people, but you want to be like a standard deviation away from 55 at the minimum so that you can really get that sweet spot of having enough people making 55K or more in that area. So I would put you in the 60s, you know, really. So I'm in an area of 110. And I honestly... I honestly feel the the higher, the more affluent in your area, the better. So it's 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 a scaled thing. Minimum might be sixty something, but you know, I, I obviously if there's higher income, that's just better, and it's just a gradient, right? But right. I wouldn't, um, yeah, I wouldn't count an area out because it has like seventy versus hundred. But I would definitely prefer an area with a higher income, especially if you offer a suite of procedures. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. What are your thoughts about office buildings versus, because I think, you know, the whole time everybody says have good visibility, good shopping center. A lot of stuff here, a lot of the practices are in office buildings. Would that be something that, uh, you know, you'd shy away from or would you try to, you know, not not really a big difference as long as the hygiene percentage is good, as long as the, you know, the rent is in check? So how much do you want to grow the practice? You're going to have to grow it a lot. So. Right. you need to see. Uh, so the nice thing about buying a practice is you don't have to, like, do all this guesswork how many new patients yeah. are they getting right now yeah. that'll tell you about the location and the demographics yeah. and everything that you need and, to and compare that to how much they're already pushing right. through marketing and okay. you know trying to get external patients so you know it, it'll be a, you're you're going to be diagnosing what's already there you're not necessarily making this blue sky projection based off of a google view which is you know kind of what happens with you know looking for real estate for a startup or something which is usually where right. you know if you're going through the breakaway mentality that's kind of where that comes from so yeah, it's going to be an evaluation of the practice that you're that you're looking at. So my, I feel like you're spending. I don't want to say you're spending more time than necessary on this process, Probably. but I'm curious to hear. So, w- what are you doing with four or five hours a day? I mean, you have all the information there. Like they give you a spreadsheet with their date of birth and like you know what are you what are you really <laughs> doing? Uh, a lot of them down here. A lot of them are sold to corporate. So a lot of times when you go on the website, okay. you'll see that they've sold. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm just trying to save money because uh, I figure it's about a buck, buck twenty, a buck seventeen, buck eighteen per per per, per mailer. So I feel like uh, 
you know, a lot of them, a lot of them have sold to corporate. A good amount of them have, you know, partnered up. So if you look at the bio, you see a doc joined, you know, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's a partner at that point, you know. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to weed out a lot of the, because if I just wrote a letter to everybody, I'd probably write four or five times the amount, because you could weed them out. I'd probably do about five times the so, mailers that I'm actually doing. How, how many, so 55 and up, just you're sending them to everybody. How many are we looking at? Right now, for this particular county, this is the major county here. We'd be mm -hmm. looking at uh, oh, second forty-four pages, about thirty on each page. So forty-four times thirty. Wow. Yeah, okay. that's and a just, good list. And that's just one county, and you have other ones that I'm trying to hit. Smaller ones that I'm trying to trying to hit. So I'm trying to cut that down because a lot so of you them got twelve hundred right now, and you're trying to cut it down to like. So well, I agree I, with I, that I, idea of cutting it down a little bit, but. Hmm. Let's find the fast way to cut them down. So what is the fastest way we can think of to cut this down? That's what I've been trying to figure out. Um, so what is their, do you have the link to their website in that list? I don't know. I have to Google. So you it. Google their name and you click on their website. A lot of them, they, a lot of the older guys, you know, they, they don't have everything linked. So you have to Google the name. Sometimes it doesn't come up. There's no reviews. It's just the name. So you have to. You know, so then I Google the address of the uh, practice, and then all of a sudden I go to Street View and it tells me the practice name. So I'll put the practice name in, and then it'll come up to a website. Okay. So is that like how hard it would be for a patient to find that office too? Like they suck at marketing that bad? Most likely, yeah. I mean, you know, nothing's linked. So um, if you try and, yeah, so it they would be probably good. don't have a group practice. Valid point. Valid point. So I think we can cross that one off. Okay. If I Google somebody and I cannot see their practice on the internet, they're probably not. They don't have 2,000 patients. That's my mm -hmm. guess. That's fair. Yeah, that's a fair yeah. assumption. That's a great point. That's so point. let's Google them. And if, if they have no reviews, no online presence, nothing. I mean, there might be that pie in the sky practice that just like, Everybody knows the guy, but nobody writes a review and they just have this big practice, but it's like invisible on the internet. We will happily miss that one to save hours and hours of time on the 99% of them that are not that practice. Mm -hmm. Fair now, we've Googled them. If their website's not there, they're out. If their website is there, we click on it. We count hygienists. Mm -hmm. Right? If there's not right. two... They're out. That could be one of the things holding me back, actually, because the practicing that I used to work in, he wasn't on top. He had a website, but, you know, we'd have three and a half to four hygienists, whatever. You know, it would be, yes, yeah, let's call it three, whatever it would be. And on the website, he had maybe one or two, and one of those was long gone. You know, so it wasn't updated. So every time I see, you know, fewer, fewer, but I kind of worry, I kind of wonder, well, what if he's not keeping it updated? From your experience, you feel like most guys do do keep it updated. So whatever's on the website is actually. It's, uh, you don't even have to do hygienists. Just look at size of team. If I go there and there's a picture right. of two people, I'm probably not going to send the guy a letter. Exactly. If I go there and there's like six people and yeah. there's a staff photo, it looks like a, like, you know, like a large family, you know, I'm not going to yeah. like, that's the, I want that practice. I want I want so many people in the photo. I can't tell who's who. Yeah, and a wide so angle just, lens shot. Yeah, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. But essentially, it's like let's quickly right. You got twelve hundred practices, so let's do a go through and let's just quickly weed out as many as we can, so you can get some solid leads. Right? If it's corporate, you cross it off. You mm -hmm. know, who cares about the partnership thing? There's two dentists there that could work in your favor. Maybe one wants to sell. Maybe they both want to sell and they both want to associate. You don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, send yeah. them a letter, send okay. them a letter and make a phone call. It's not hard. And, mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about the cost per letter. Mm -hmm. Where are you getting the buck 20? Um, <laughs> the stamps, uh, 55 cents, the envelope, I forgot what it was. And the uh, printouts, cause I went to office max or one of those to print it out. Cause I have the letter in color. Uh, is there, mm -hmm. So that was about 59 cents. I want to say per, per copy. So 59, 55 plus the envelope and whatever else. Okay. All right. That's fair. I'll let it slide. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we do still have to be mindful of the potential cost of a Yeah. But to, so, right? like, let's just say you mail to everybody for a buck 20 a mailer, you know, $1,400, 1500 
I think is relatively minimal for the ability to get this many practices at your door. Mm -hmm. And if we could cut the list down to four or 500, I, I honestly wouldn't consider the cost a whole lot. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you could I'm make not, that more. I'm yeah. Not, I mean, not, I wouldn't think about it. Yeah. I just, yeah, not, I wouldn't let that deter me from sending to a large list. Like I'd rather much have a large list and pay for the buck 20 that oh, yeah. postage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, once I'm done with this count, I got one more down here and then I'll hit the ones in Dallas. So uh, just my biggest issue now is going through the list quickly. So I'll try to utilize what you know you were saying, yeah. just because this is a you know tedious process. I'm only going through about a hundred a day. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think going through the list quickly, not letting your uh, previous experience kind of yeah. let you prejudge practices that have too much clinical offerings, and being clear. So I think I, I feel like we did. You feel like we've helped you kind of clear up what the practice that you're going to buy looks like. For sure, for sure. I had a good idea of that, the, the, the ops definitely, because I was, one practice mm -hmm. I was looking at was just, you know, phenomenal as far as what was there. Um, you know, he was doing 1.2, 1.3 without doing anything. Hygiene was cranking. We had three hygienists, but he only had four ops or whatever it was, and there's no expansion. So there's no way. And that was tempted. My, my buddy talked me out of even talking to them because there's no way you could work out of four. Whoa, 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 whoa. How does he have three hygienists and four ops? The things that three hygienists. I'm sure he has. I'm sure he's playing time somehow. Maybe he has a hygiene day, where um, you know, I don't know how. I, I never talked to the guy, so I don't know how he managed it. But whatever I got from the broker said three hygienists and four apps. Yeah, I, I would, I would look into that. And if it's three full time hygienists, I would be very interested. If it was three hygienists equaling like a hygienist and a half, then I'm not interested. Gotcha. Right. Because right. I doubt that it's three full time hygienists, but. The three hygienist practice for sale does not come around very often. And if it's only doing 1.2, um, I'd have, be very interested to see what's possible there. What would you yeah. think about? Would you have to move it? Would you move it immediately? How would you kind of go about that? There's no expansion. I, I want to see. First, I want to see is it legit? Mm -hmm. Is it really three full time hygienists doing 1.2 million? I, right? Because you give me three full time hygienists with your clinical skill set, that's 1.8 really easily if we have the space. Right. And then it's. How do we make the space? And then eventually you move that practice. But that to me is honestly, that has to be worth it. Mm -hmm. Because think about it. If you're paying you know, 800 for that practice with three full-time hygienists and they somehow have the patient flow, you could, you could get pretty far ahead and you could you know, potentially down the road move the space. Uh, that one, because of how many patients are already there and how many hygienists, if it is legit, which I doubt it is, yeah, I wouldn't write that off. I wouldn't write it off so easily. So that That's, situation would make a four-op practice more viable mm, with the idea that he'd be moving it later on? I hate that so much, but I just – that's how much I think of – that's, that's how much a, I that's value. A monkey wrench, George. Yeah, that is a monkey wrench, right? We're it's wrapping something that it up, I, man. It isn't a nice pretty bow. And then <laughs> I know. It's just – so, right, but that goes back to how hard yeah. is it to find a practice like that? Right. It's tough, yeah. And I, I honestly doubt it even is, in fact, that because three mm -hmm. full high, high hygienists is 600K in hygiene. There's no way that thing is 50% hygiene. Yeah. No, so it was, has to be. What was the hygiene percent? Do you know? It was about 40. I think I did one about four to five in hygiene. Yeah, man. I, I Let's. Can we look at that Let's thing? Case study. Like, yeah, let's. Do you have it? Yeah, let me try to. Uh... Let's wrap up part one. And let's right. do part two looking I'll at this email. practice. I, I, hey, I want to see this thing, okay? <laughs> All right, sounds good. I'll email yeah, you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not writing this thing off. Okay, let's, we're going to wrap up this part one. This is surprising Absolutely. me. Yeah, um, okay. All right, yeah, so well, we're going to wrap this up. Yes, well, I, I really appreciate everybody hanging in with us there. Um, I hope you got a lot hearing from Batman here. He had a lot of uh, good things to work with, but I think that we helped him along in establishing his vision. And uh, we have generated... Some clarity, but also just a, just enough confusion for another episode. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you guys will hang on with us and uh, listen to part two of this. So uh, until then, thanks so much. And uh, we'll, uh, you'll be hearing from us next week.